live. Mission log number 223. We don't give enough space to ourselves to feel, to think. And when we don't do that, we are far more likely to feel depressed, to experience deep anxiety, to feel overwhelmed, to feel resentful, to feel guilty, and not even understand why we feel that way. We are the thinker of our thoughts, the feeler of our feelings, the keeper of our needs. If we don't tune in and start asking, how am I doing today? And what can I do for me? Who else is going to do it? Welcome to Stellar Life Podcast. Get inspired and live out loud. From love, freedom, and success to having it all. Here's your host, coach, speaker, and shining star, Orion. Orion, you're looking good. Hello and welcome to Stellar Life Podcast. This is your host, Orion. Welcome to the show. We're going to teach you how to release all baggage. I love this approach of working on yourself in order to get something new. Because if you do the same thing over and over again, you expect a different result. This is the definition of insanity. So you want to change something, especially when you step into a new project or a new relationship. You want to change who you are, how you show up, and how you show up will be so much brighter if you release those all baggage. If you come into a new relationship as a clean slate, especially when I work with my clients, I work on their internal being. Because when you change your vibration, when you heal, when you love and celebrate yourself, then you can attract an incredible relationship, then success will follow from that point of attraction. And that point of attraction is because you worked on yourself and you cleaned whatever needs to be cleaned and you let go of what does not serve you anymore. Because if you step into a new relationship with your old baggage, then you're going to contaminate that relationship instead of making it wonderful. So the world does revolve around you. I invited Natalie Liu. She's an author, speaker, podcaster. She's helping people pleasers, perfectionists, and overthinkers tidy up their emotional baggage so they can enjoy love, care, trust, and respect-filled life. Natalie is extraordinary, and I'm sure you are going to enjoy this episode tremendously. And now, without further ado, on to the show. Two, one, zero, Hey, Natalie, and welcome to Stellar Life Podcast. It's a pleasure having you. Thank you so much for being here. Oh, thank you, Ryan. It's lovely to be here as well. Thank you. Uh, before we start, can you share a little bit about your passion and why you chose to help people release their old baggage? Well, as is the way with a lot of us who get into this work of, of helping people with their lives, it's because of where you're coming from yourself. And so back in the day, so sort of the late 90s, early 2000s, I struggled with forming healthy relationships with liking myself, with not burning myself out at work. And then I had a health crisis. And it was right about the same time that I was also involved in an affair with a co-worker. Mm. And everything sort of came crashing down. And I was re forced to take a really good, long, hard look at myself and what I was doing. And what was interesting is like a lot of people in these situations, you think that, oh, you know, I'm confident or I'm smart or you feel like, oh, I, I think I like myself. But actually, I didn't like myself very much at all. And I would think that I was really good at relationships. It's like, oh, I love commitment. I love relationships. But I only ever wanted to be in a relationship with people who either didn't want a relationship or who absolutely were not people that I should be in a relationship with. And so in looking to heal my body, I stumbled into healing my relationships and my self-esteem at the same time. 
And when I was working my way through that and talking out loud about it on my blog at the time, because I've been blogging for uh, coming up to 16 years. Wow. Yeah. So it's a long time. Like I feel like a geriatric blogger. I always say, but um, <laughs> I started off with a like a personal blog in uh, 2004 and immediately had people who were interested in me just sharing stories and anecdotes about you know life here in London and my struggles with relationships. But what's interesting is when you can read this stuff back to yourself and you notice patterns. And when I started talking out loud about what I was experiencing and what I was letting go of, people were like, please keep talking more about this and please teach us more about this. And here I am, <laughs> sort of 16 years later. And really, I felt called to speak more openly about the, you know, the effects of feeling that you've been abandoned and the, the, the experiences that you go through as a child, like trauma or just like where you get confused beliefs. And I felt called to talk about that because I thought, well, if I can help at least one person avoid what I've been through, or if I could help one person get out of what I've been through, then I'd feel like I was paying it forward in some way. And here I am all these years later. You said you did not know that you don't like yourself and you didn't know that you thought you were great at relationships. So what was the aha moment of, oh, I don't really love myself. And what did you do to heal that? There was a couple of things, which was I was seeing a guy and I say that very loosely for about four or five months. And it was one of those ones where, you know, it starts off, you feel like, oh, this is amazing. And then it just was really just struggling along. And I realized that it wasn't working and I got on the phone with him and, you know, the usual, oh, you know, you're so great, blah, 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 but I'm not ready for a relationship. And I heard myself saying, what makes you think I'd be the type of woman who would put up with being in this kind of situation? And as I was saying it, you know, when you sort of feel like everything sort of shifted mm. around you, but it was like, I, I, honestly, you know, people sometimes talk about their life flashing before their eyes. But suddenly I could see myself across a whole load of relationships, putting up with all sorts of stuff. And I could hear myself in my head going, uh, he knows that you would put up with this because you have been that oh, person. Wow. And that really, it's like it set off this chain reaction of suddenly I could, I really started looking at my life going, oh my gosh, like, because I think sometimes as humans, we don't realize how we sometimes delude ourselves and it takes yeah. <laughs> yeah. something or someone to come along and shake us out of what. So, for instance, this, the times that we find ourselves in, you know, these these Rona times that we are in, I will hear from people who be like, I'm totally fine, like not being in a relationship or I'm totally fine on my own. I like myself. And then we're in these corona times where we have this social distancing, where there's, you know, there's all this upheaval. And suddenly all the things that they sort of built their identity around, their, their, their self-concept around, become destabilized mm -hmm. by that. And suddenly it's like, oh, actually, I really am not comfortable, for instance, being on my own. Or, wow, like I actually don't know or like myself very well. Or, wow, I spent all of my life at work and commuting and I don't know what to do with myself now that I'm supposed to be in the house all the time. Yeah, right? People have to face their demons. Yeah. And deal with everything. Like we all have to deal with things we've, we've never dealt before. One thing that has happened to me lately is I get floods of childhood memories, good and bad. I don't know what it is, but so many, there's so many, like never before. I think something is clearing. I don't know. Yeah, I think so. Because it's like our bodies remember everything. You know, our nervous system remembers everything. It's like it's recorded everything that we've been through before. And so when we find ourselves in a sort of a, a shock situation, and it is a shock, our lives have changed dramatically in the space of a few weeks. So our body has experienced a shock as well. And I've been saying to people, you know, I'm not necessarily saying that we are all as such traumatized because some people are handling things differently, but actually we are experiencing trauma, whether we're aware of it or not. Yeah. And I think for me also, because I grew up in Israel and as a small child experienced many wars and, and terror attacks and all that. And when I was a small child during the Gulf War, we had to wear gas masks. 
for like a month and a half, not all day, but every time there was an alarm and we had to go to the sealed room and we, <laughs> you know, so I guess this situation brings up, maybe that is the link for me. I don't know. Maybe. Yeah, because the, because that's the way that our mind works is that if you imagine like, uh, you know, in detective or cop shows and they've got like the evidence lockup room and it's like filing cabinets and shelves upon shelves, you know, just packed full of boxes of evidence. That's what our subconscious is like. It's filed everything that we've been through in life. We don't know the overwhelming majority of the contents of what's in there, but it's it's, it's all linked up. And it, you know, makes all these connections. It's like all this batch filing. And so certain feelings are filed with certain types of events. And it's only when we're in certain situations, and it could take a very unique type of situation like what you're in now, where suddenly it's like now things that have maybe been suppressed because of the situation that you're in, they've been activated and they're coming up, but you don't necessarily have a context for them because it's not a like for like situation, but your body feels some sort of connection to that, even if you don't consciously feel that connection. It's quite fascinating, I find. Yeah, it's pretty powerful. And I think this is a very good time to work on clearing our emotional baggage because this transition to post-COVID-19 world is not going to be easy. No. And we are in a place where we are, all of us, are creating the new world. Interactions between people are going to be different. People, I think, are going to be more suspicious of each other. I mean, it's going to take time to get used to the new normal. And we want to build a new normal from a place of healing rather than a place of struggle. Yes. I mean, that's so beautifully said, because I think when this first happened, I remember speaking on my own podcast and saying, you know, as humans, we've needed to pause, to slow down, to feel, to to think about certain things, but we didn't want to. We didn't want to slow down. We didn't want to pause. We didn't want to do any of these things. And then this is like a hard stop, a hard reset. And all the things that we have resisted doing in some way, shape or form, I think, are going to come up. I will talk to people who really need to have a dating break or a dating hiatus. I'm not saying like for an inordinate amount of time, like years or something like they're going into like taking a vow of celibacy. Perhaps I'm tired of saying, geez, for three months, take a rest. Like no texting random people that you just started chatting with on Tinder or Bumble or whatever. Just put a pause on that. No catching up with exes or whatever. Total break from dating to focus on you and your life and just calm your body in your body down, including your mind. And some, often many, cannot do that. Mm -mm. They they resist that and they will start off being like, oh, yeah, 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 of course. And a week or two in and they are on some app or they're hooking up with the ex or whichever else. And then you have something like this come along. And of course, if you choose to, you you might decide, oh, well, I'll do video dates or whatever, you know, with some people. But actually, I've heard from people over this last while and they said, you know what? I feel like I finally have the permission I wouldn't give myself before to do what I needed to do, to face what I need to face. Because I, I'm a great believer that our past, you know, our experiences, our relationships, the feelings we carry around, basically our emotional baggage contains messages, clues, guidance about who we are, how to heal, who we can be. But these are the very things that we actually resist looking at. It's like, I don't want to look at my, I don't want to feel, I don't want to look at my past. I'm not saying we have to go on some massive excavation, but if we don't even look at the things that are practically smacking us in the face going, please deal with me so that I don't have to continue taking over your life and basically, you know, creating self-destruction, we just avoid all of that. And now whether we do it now or in the coming weeks or months, we have to face that stuff. We all, in some way, shape or form, are having to to face things that we didn't know that we needed to address or change in some way. Right. How do we do this detective work? How do we identify and how do we clear our emotional baggage? Something I suggest to people is, I mean, you can take any topic you want, but I think that 
the two particular good places to start are anger and or with something that you know is a bit of a hot touch issue right now in your life. Because the thing that I always say to people is, let's say that we are really bothered, like angry, stressed, frustrated, resentful, disappointed, whatever it is about something or someone. So it's not that that situation or that person isn't whatever we think it might be. It's not that we shouldn't feel how we feel, but we wouldn't respond emotionally, mentally, physically, even spiritually in the way that we do if we didn't already have something in our baggage, something in our past that was coming up for us in that moment. It's what is squeezed out of us. Yeah. If you are a lemon and you're being squeezed, you'll have lemon juice. And if you're an orange and you've been squeezed, then comes orange juice. So <laughs> it's already inside of you. <laughs> yeah. I love that. Like people think that feelings like it's like, oh, I can just stuff them down and then they die off. No, they don't. They're there. They just seep out in other ways. And so what what we tend to do as humans is it's like, oh, I can have all of this anger and resentment and frustration and craving and whatever it might be that I'm carrying around with me. And I can just pile and pile and pile it up. But we can only carry around so much. And at some point, it becomes too much for us to carry the excess that we're carrying around. And we have to offload along the way. And so it's why I ask people when they experience those, the, the anger, which they call the negative emotions, but it's like, well, actually those emotions are just as valid because they're giving us clues about whatever it is that we need to be or do or have. Mm. But it's like, what's the baggage behind it? If we feel sort of disproportionately affected by something that's come on. If we're, if we're freaked out by somebody having boundaries, if we're freaked out over disappointment, if we feel like overwhelmed because we're in the situation that we're in right now, it doesn't take away from what we're going through in the present. But what is going on in our past that also reflects what we're in? Mm -hmm. So for instance, boundaries are a really good example of this. Like I will hear from so many people who genuinely, they're lovely people and they do want to not just experience more love, care, trust and respect for themselves, but they want to give it. But these are the same people who really have an issue with boundaries. And it's not because it's like, oh, I hate boundaries because I want to do bad things to people. No, they seem to feel really uncomfortable with boundaries because they think that it's like bad and that it means that there's, you know, there's something wrong with you if somebody has to have boundaries or it's like boundaries are selfish, boundaries are this and that. So I say to people, when that comes up and you feel uncomfortable about saying no or somebody else saying no to you, and maybe you feel angry or resentful or disappointed, what does that reflect in your past? Who does that remind you of? If you can't think of who, what does it remind you of? Where else have you felt similarly? Even if you think, well, that doesn't make sense that that's the thing that pops into my head. That's the thing that it's reminding you of. That's why you're responding in the way that you do. And then we can look at like, oh, well, how can I evolve my response? So I'm a good example of this. Like, I had very negative associations with criticism and feedback because of my upbringing. My mom could be very, very critical of me and my teens. And after a while, I couldn't distinguish between her, I don't know, trying to give me loving feedback and yes, sometimes giving me very inappropriate feedback and criticism. So I got into adulthood and if somebody expressed feedback and what, what I perceived as like criticism, I would basically respond like a teenage girl inside and sometimes externally as well. Mm -hmm. I treated these people like my mother. And after a while, as I became more conscious, aware and present, you know, as I started really connecting with myself, I became aware of, well, hold on a second, how old am I right now? Why am I behaving and feeling and, you know, like I'm 12 or 14 when I'm like 28? And it was making these connections and going, okay, so this is happening right now, but what does it remind me of in the past? And then I could be like, oh, but it's not the same situation. Like this person's not my mom. I'm not that kid anymore. How could I respond differently that would make me 28 instead of 14? Mm. And these were really big game changers for me because then it made everything so much less personal because I would get so triggered by any criticism, even if it was very useful feedback and it wasn't really criticism at all. It'd be like, I'd feel so wounded. But as soon as I became aware of like, oh, I behave like everybody's my mom. 
That was a game changer for me. Wow. My relationship with criticism dramatically changed. And I've applied that same attitude across the board to anything in my life where I find myself like when coronavirus really sort of kicked up a notch and we were, you know, there was a lot of talk about, well, you know, this could be like the death toll and the economic impact and, and that type of thing and schools closing. And this was like maybe about a week before schools closed here in England. I had terrible anxiety for mm. about 48 hours. Mm. And when I really started to try to get grounded and I was like, OK, well, there's obvious reasons why I could feel anxious right now. But what else? is coming up for me. Where else have I felt this way? What is it reminding me of? And it was reminding me of other times in my life in distant past when I felt out of control and reminding myself, well, hold on, you're not back there anymore. And you can respond differently and calming myself and actually speak back to myself. And so that I didn't end up freaking out even more, because I think sometimes when our baggage comes up, we just go into autopilot and we just start heaping, throwing more stuff at it that makes us feel even worse. Whereas if we can almost hold space for us to recognize, oh, my past is coming up and this have this curiosity, like, oh, what's this is about? Like when you said you're getting flooded by childhood memories that you are put away, but you're having, you're not making a judgment mm -hmm. about you as mm -hmm. these come up. No. You're holding the space for it, whichever memory comes up, whether it is as we, you know, as, as humans, we do like to go positive or negative, but whichever memory it is, it's like, there's a curiosity like, oh, what's this, what's this about? Rather than somebody else might experience that and be like, oh my gosh, like what's wrong with me? Like what kind of weirdo am I that I am this way? So I think that in any given situation where we find ourselves feeling a very, very strong emotional reaction, one that we might term as air quotes negative, it's like, what's the baggage behind it? It's the fundamental question that I probably ask on every single podcast that I do. And it allows us to return to who we are and to acknowledge, oh, wow, my past is coming up in some way, shape or form. And now I have an opportunity, even if it's a teeny, teeny, tiny bit to do a little bit of healing here, because that's what we have in any given situation. Our relationships help us to heal, grow and learn like any, not just our romantic relationships, all of our relationships. And so when we encounter an issue with, I don't know, a person in a shop or at work or with family, in that moment, we have an opportunity to evolve our response, even in a teeny tiny way that just does a little bit of healing. We don't have to get rid of all of our emotional baggage because <laughs> We're always accumulating, not necessarily at the same rate that we have in the past, but there's no such thing as being baggage free. Mm. But I think that when we have that awareness of, oh, this stuff is coming up for me, how can I respond a little bit differently here? We are now making healing ourselves just being a part of our everyday life. It's the thing I have to remind people of is there's no such thing as being like, oh, I'm reaching a destination of being healed because that's not how being human works. Healing can be a part of our day-to-day, -day, of our relationships, once we become aware that we are humans who have baggage that comes up in various different situations and that we can respond differently. Yeah. So Natalie, you were talking about responding differently. And I had something that happened about a week ago where I was walking down the street wearing my baby. I have a seven-month-old and with my husband. And we had a really lovely walk and we took some funny videos. And then down the street came this crazy older lady wearing a mask and she started screaming, why aren't you wearing a mask? Why aren't you wearing a mask? I wish oh you all gosh. get sick. I wish you all get <gasps> sick. Yeah, it was, it was like, <clears throat> it was crazy. And I'm like, I'm wearing my little baby, you know, and I don't want to be a bad example. So I just yelled back at her and I said, I'm wishing you healing and God bless you. And I just said good words. Yes. I just said good words. But when I went home, it shook me. Yeah. And in my heart of hearts, I did want to punch her in the face. I'm like, how dare you? <laughs> <laughs> the mama bear comes out. You're like, yeah, especially when I am such a mama bear, especially when I'm wearing David or when he's near me. I'm like, oh, you all be careful. <laughs> but it's also can feel very violating in those situations. Somebody bellowing at you in the street. Yeah, and that was even before we were ordered to put masks in grocery stores, not in the street. Like if you were walking down the street and if you are exercising, you don't need to wear a mask. But she was obviously mentally ill. 
but it still shook me from the inside. And and even though I, I gave her good words when I came home, I was still shook and I felt this this dark. I guess what happened to me is like it's like how can someone wish such bad things on a stranger and on a baby? You know, I'm like, yeah, how? Like that? I think that was mind boggling for me. And I think in that moment, sometimes people. They, I think some people, like, for instance, in that situation, she is clearly very triggered by what is going on around her. And I think that sometimes people kind of lose themselves and they say something that's absolutely outrageous when mm. you when you really look at it in the cold light of day. And I think when you're in that situation and you try to choose love in that moment because you think, well, I'm not going to, it's not who I am. Like you're not somebody who would do the same thing as her. So you wouldn't turn around and just start screaming at somebody in the street and wishing ill on them. But in that moment, like you've chosen, you're like, you know what? I'm just going to just say kind words, but it's actually not necessarily how you feel Mm. because actually what you felt first and understandably so was anger. Mm -hmm. And in amongst that anger as well, I think is a level of fear, but also when you feel shaken that way, it's one, the shock of that person's behavior. But also if you've ever been in any other situation where there's a sense of sort of injustice or violation. I think the shock came after because when that happened, I didn't feel much. When I came home and I processed what just happened, then I was, oh my God, this just happened. Yeah. And and I think sometimes actually what can also happen in that situation is in that moment, you like you say, you don't necessarily have time to feel or think too much and you just do what you need to do. And then it's it's like, you you know, when you sort of have what maybe felt like was a near death experience or, you know, you think about, oh, my gosh, like what could have happened or or you suddenly you start playing things over in your mind. And then in your head, you're going, she said, what? She and so now you as as you're playing this and it's like when you have those conversations in the shower or you know (laughs) I wish I told them this and that yeah and that's how you can actually end up getting fired up because our imagine like our mind doesn't differentiate between you know like when we're imagining a situation or sometimes we're imagining you know sort of doom and gloom our mind doesn't distinguish between uh, what's actually happening and what we're imagining. So I think that sometimes when we're working ourselves up and we're sort of replaying things over in our mind, that it actually stimulates the same emotional responses as if we were going through that experience with a person. And that's because I had somebody really treat me quite appallingly in a, in a professional situation. And I remember that very similar to you, you know, when you get that sort of composure and you somehow just manage to hold yourself together and inside you really want to tear the up. <laughs> but outwardly, you know, you, you're polite, you know, all the rest. But, you know, for that happened on a Thursday and it took until the Tuesday for me to stop shaking. I was actually shaking for a good three, four days afterwards. Wow. There was a lot of release going on. Yeah. And I think that it was like, once, once I actually started to talk about what had happened, the shock of it, I mean, this person basically she was racist towards me in a professional environment. But I think that once I just talked about it and then I was, and then because she in a bit of a similar fashion to you where she, this person clearly did not express any remorse. Like some other people were like, Oh my gosh, like I can't believe I just turned around and said that. And then be like, Oh my God, I'm so sorry. Seeing you with a baby, please. I didn't mean that, you know, please forgive. But instead she's just like kicking off at you. And so I think that there's a part of us as well. that's like, but I didn't deserve that. And why would they speak to me like that? And that's so unfair. And this is just not warranted. And so you're going over and over, and I should have said this, and I can't believe it. And that's where my, and I think it brought up a lot of stuff from from childhood as well, where it was like the sort of sense of unfairness for me. And so, yeah, for three, four days, and my husband turned to me, I think it must have been on the Monday. And he said, look, I totally get why you would be upset and angry about what's happened but I'm seeing the effect that this is happening to you. And I know you can't just like switch it off like that and just like forget. But I also think that you also need to look at how can you park this? Like, Mm. how can you choose to park this? And, you know, it was like the following morning I got up and the shaking had stopped. I was like, it's like I was steering myself away from replaying the event over and over in my mind and thinking about it. And I woke up, it's like I, I, like what we were talking about before we came on, you set that intention. Mm. And I was like, 
I have had three, four days of this. I can't continue on like with my body like this. I'm choosing to let this go and I'm going to keep choosing. And and this is where we take ourselves, you know, we, we zig instead of zag or we zag instead of zig. So we don't do what we did before. Mm. So Natalie, these days we are, I think all of us are experiencing so many emotions and, and in a sense, we're all grieving an old way of life that is probably going to change. And there are five stages to grief by Elizabeth Cobbler. Yeah. The first is denial and then is anger, then bargaining, depression, and then acceptance. And they don't always necessarily happen in the same order and they can all happen at once. What are some of your best tools to handling emotions? I always recommend to people, and of course, everybody has a different relationship with with writing and talk, but journaling, oh my gosh, can save you in what can feel like your darkest, darkest moments and can help you to make sense of how you're feeling on a day-to-day basis and help you to understand how to take care of you. And I say to people whether you, it doesn't have to be some, you know, a war and peace enormous novel that you're writing. <laughs> but even even if you spend a minute or two going today, you know, I felt this, this and this, and this was where I struggled today, or actually this was really good for me today. I say to people, you spend a week or two doing that, you will see patterns in your life. And you will start to notice where, oh, that thing sets me off or that person sets me off. Like I had recommended to somebody a few weeks back that because they were feeling so triggered and sort of feeling very out of control. And I said, look, I'm not saying it's a fix all because I think sometimes we can kind of have this attitude of, well, if it's not going to fix everything, I'm not going to do it. But I say to people, I have a go at keeping like a feelings diary, very brief. These are the emotions that I felt today. It doesn't matter what you call them. It's your your language. Just trying to make sense of how you're feeling on a day-to-day basis. It's like answering the question, how am I doing today or how did I do today? And I said, because what can happen is we can feel very disconnected from ourselves and we're so busy just cycling through our days that we feel a range of emotions, some maybe wonderful ones and some maybe not so wonderful ones, but we're so immersed in work or parenting or exercising or rushing around or whatever it might be that sometimes we forget what we felt and why we felt it. Mm. And then one day, maybe a few days later or a week later, we find ourselves losing it, you know, with a loved one or raging at ourselves all day long. And we don't realize that it's the cumulative effect, like a buildup of things that we haven't noticed about Mm. ourselves, things that we haven't noticed about what we're feeling. So I said to this person, just have a go at keeping a feeling sorry. Just keep it brief. I said, you don't have to spend more than two, three, five minutes on it. And I said, don't put your pressure on yourself to like, you know, be a master writer and write like, you know, your favorite author. It's just your notes on what's going on in your life. And they came back and they were like, oh, wow, like a couple of weeks of doing that. And I've realized that every time I spend a lot of time on social media and I am almost checking the news, sort of every half hour or so, my mood sinks and my anxiety goes through the roof. Mm. And then I end up eating this and I end up doing that. And she said, and she wouldn't have had that intel without actually bringing herself into her awareness with journaling. But it also helped her to vent her frustrations about not feeling in control of her life, you know, not feeling in control about work, not feeling in control about the kids being at home. And having a space to do that and realizing how that was churning her up and then being able to offer herself solutions sometimes through her writing, like understanding how she could take care of herself. And it's not necessarily that every time we journal that we're going to be like, oh, well, this could be the solution. Like this is the thing to provide here. But I think it's we don't give enough space to ourselves to feel, to think. And when we don't do that, we are far more likely to feel depressed to experience deep anxiety, to feel overwhelmed, to feel resentful, to feel guilty, and not even understand why we feel that way. So I think that in these times, doing something, even if it is one sentence, a paragraph, if you can do that daily, wonderful, even if you can do it, like catch up with yourself two, three times a week, even once a week is better than nothing at all. And what you will find actually is that when you look back on this in a few weeks or a few months time, 
You have an understanding of who you've been in this time and what you may have needed and what you might need in a few months down the road as well. You start to have an understanding of your life. It sounds profound. And I always wanted to journal. I used to journal when I was a little kid. I'm very funny when I'm journaling, even when I'm journaling about bad stuff. And I think I should do that. I think it's a great idea. So thank you for that. Yeah, do you know, I... I used I was like you. I used to 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 keep like the diaries and notes as a child, and it was journaling. I can honestly say I lived with my mother in law for about eight and a half months. Funny enough, during another pandemic, my husband is from Sierra Leone, and when the Ebola crisis happened, oh my god, yeah. So she she came here to England and she stayed with us for eight and a half months. And let's just say that we fell out about halfway <laughs> through her time here. I can imagine. <laughs> Obviously, she was not in a position to go because, you know, pandemic mm -hmm. and all that. And journaling, honestly, saved me <laughs> because I so much different conflict and feelings came up for me during that time. And I needed an outlet. And I also wanted to feel as if like, if I'm going to bring up something that I, I wanted to feel like I processed it a bit rather than it being a jumble. But journaling, that's when I really, like I rediscovered my love of journaling. And sometimes I was just pouring out a whole load of stuff. And something I say to people as well is that if you write when you're in this, what feels like quite heightened feelings. So if you feel yourself sort of feeling overwhelmed, anxious, just write whatever comes into your head, even if what you're writing is, I don't know what the hell I'm writing here. Because after about six or so minutes, my acupuncturist taught me this years ago, he said, you get into your subconscious about six or so minutes into it. And that's when the real stuff starts coming up. So it might be complete jumble. Wow. Where you're jumping all over the place, maybe in the first few minutes, and you, you might be ranting about whatever. And then I see it every time, about six to eight minutes into it, I'm starting to get the truth of why I feel the way that I do about what's bothering me. And I'm always like, oh, and if I just left it at, you know, oh, I'm just annoyed with that part, I wouldn't really get the truth of it. Right. You'll get stuck in your head and you won't get into the subconscious mind, which is the source of why you're feeling the way you're feeling and, and also the source of the answer to how to deal with it. Yeah. And, and I truly do believe like our experiences, the feelings, even memories, they contain like healing and guidance, like messages for us. And if we don't even bother to ask ourselves the question of like, how am I doing today? Or, you know, how did I do today? Not as in, you know, like when you go in a store and it's like, oh, how did we do today? And you press like the happy face and the sad face or whatever. It's not that thing. It's like so many people have have awareness about how everybody else is doing. And look, you like me, you're a mother as well. And what can happen is you become so attuned to other people's needs and wants and how somebody else is feeling that sometimes you forget how you're doing. Right. Especially when it, when you are a leader or a coach and, and you, you're so used to be there for others and yeah. you're so used to be the strong one for others. And all of us, like people who are coaches, healers, we need to heal ourselves and we need to take care of ourselves as well. Absolutely. And, and, and something I say to people is because we can sometimes be so caught up in what everybody else is thinking and feeling and doing, we sometimes are entirely disconnected from ourselves. And so I say to people, even if you don't get to the journaling yet, start your day by asking, how am I doing today? You can do it in front of the mirror, but you don't have to. But it's like, check in with you at the start of the day. How am I doing today? You might be surprised by what you say, because sometimes what we do is we just get up and go. And that makes us very ungrounded. And imagine that we just keep doing that and doing that and doing that. If we snap, if we break down in exhaustion and burnout, if we end up feeling low and depressed, we might have no clue because it, we can't remember the last time we checked in. And some people say to me, well, what happens if I ask myself how I'm doing? And it turns out I'm not doing too great. Well, then you can accommodate for that in your day. You can maybe go a little bit gentler on you. Maybe you can feed yourself some breakfast for once. Maybe <laughs> you can take a few minutes to acknowledge, well, if I don't feel that great today, why might that be? And what can I do for me, even if it's teeny tiny, what can I do for me, even if it can't fix the situation in all its totality, what can I do for me now or over the course of today that would just mean that I had my back a little bit and I was just trying to help me out in some way? 
if you wake up and you're like, oh my gosh, I actually feel really, really low today. You might say, you know what? Actually going to work is helpful, but taking on way too much, not helpful. So helpful. (laughs) So this is where we can take better care of ourselves. We are the thinker of our thoughts, the feeler of our feelings, the keeper of our needs. If we don't tune in and start asking, how am I doing today? And what can I do for me? Who else? is going to do. Right. Amazing. Amazing. I want to talk a little bit about your new course that you have online. It's called Break the Cycle. And it's about handling relationships and especially relationships during COVID-19. So in the extreme, and this is very sad, that domestic violence has increased. And those ladies, mostly ladies, have nowhere to go or it's scarier to leave, I guess. So one thing that I think everybody can do is just watch out. If you hear something from your neighbors, don't ignore it, report it. This is really important. But generally, I think most couples are, uh, I mean, some couples have this this lovely honeymoon feeling, but I think most couples, especially with kids, it's a bumpy ride. It's hard to be cooped in. It's hard to handle all the uncertainty. It's hard, like we all have all those emotions bubbling and then we take it out on our partners. So what is some wisdom that we can take with us to handle that? I think that what's interesting is there were some people I had spoken to pre-COVID and they felt very, very frustrated about how things were in their relationship. And what's been interesting is this enforced time has where they thought it would actually make things worse. And, you know, it'd be like, as we say here, handbags at dawn, where they'd be arguing morning, noon and night. It seems to have reshuffled things where it forced them to, because they re- they realized that actually sometimes they were latching on to stuff that was petty and keeping score. And so for some of these people, it forced them to take on a new perspective and to have a new appreciation of each other. So that can be a place to look at, because I think sometimes when you realize, oh, well, actually, I can't just walk out of the house and go to work and commute. I can't just drive off and go shopping or whatever. We are here. And then you sometimes, I say to people, you have to pick and choose your battles. And I'm not saying that we should be like, oh, well, I need to dismiss most of the things that bother me. Peace, love and ice cream. Yeah, but it's like, (laughs) actually, I say to people, if you start to have levels, so understanding the difference between something that is like, for instance, if you put things on a level of naught to five, clearly something that's a naught one or two is not really bothering you that much. But if everything is a five, then nothing's a five. And so I've spoken to, I remember speaking to a couple and she was like, whether it was taking the bins out or as you were saying, America taking the trash out or a disagreement about how they were doing something with the kids or whether something had been tidied away, everything was level five. And I said, honestly, you can't take each other seriously in in your relationship if everything is going to result in Armageddon. Like everything warrants <laughs> bringing out the artillery <laughs> at sort of level five. You have to have levels and really start to get an understanding of what really warrants things kicking off. Like I find it myself, my husband very rarely disagree about something that's going on in the house, like with chores. And I think that's because we realized like for us, we sort of established it, that that's not the type of thing that we want to be getting into arguments about. But obviously there are other things that we could we could get into arguments about, but we don't get into arguments all the time because I think we realize, well, some things don't warrant an argument or a disagreement. Some things, when I, like I've realized, I'll hold my hands up, right? Sometimes when I'm irritated with the kids, or with my husband. And so I'm going around and I'm, you know, banging the vacuum cleaner around the house or cleaning, (laughs) making, making them hyper aware of me. When I really examine my irritation. Let me show you how I vacuum. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. When I actually start, I've noticed most of the time when I end up getting really irritated, it's not really about them. It's either one, because something has peed me off at work something else has gone on and I'm frustrated. I don't know. It could be like, I don't know. I wanted to get a whole load of stuff done and it didn't. And I'm frustrated with myself. And then I go in the house. Maybe I see that something is untidy. And rather than acknowledge, I'm really frustrated with myself. Now I'm like, oh my gosh, why hasn't everybody like just tied it up? And then I've started to notice this thing about myself. So I realized, and I think this is something that's very present in a lot of relationships. Sometimes the irritations that we're expressing to our partners or about them 
are not really things that are about our partners. Sometimes they are things that are really about other things that we don't have feel that we have control over or that we haven't addressed. And that was a real eye opener for me because then I I was able to sort of step back from some of my irritations. Other times it's me not expressing a need. Mm. I don't need to go and thump the vacuum cleaner around the place and like making loads of noise while I'm cleaning and sort of getting into this sort of frantic thing. I could just turn around and say, guys, can we just spend like 20 minutes doing a big tidy around the place? Can you guys put this thing away? But instead I'm trying to drop hints with the, the vacuum cleaner. <laughs> so I, uh, the thing that I say to people is, is there a way that you can say this instead of only going part way and dropping a hint? I think that everybody's relationships would change dramatically if we cut down on hinting. Mm. I think it is a massive source of strain. And people will argue, well, I don't want to cause an argument. You know, I don't want to upset feelings. But the problem that actually kicks in, not from talking about what bothers us, not from being direct, it comes about actually from not talking about what bothers us and just hoping that people will sort of figure it out by osmosis, that they will mind read us, that we can Jedi mind trick them with the housework. (laughs) That would be lovely. Yeah, or doing good deeds. So I, I think that what we have to do in these times, like, I mean, honestly, if I have to clean the kitchen one more, I feel like I clean the kitchen like three, four times a day. I know, me too. I feel like I'm like constantly cleaning. Constant. That's quite frustrating. Yeah. <laughs> and But then I, I say to myself, well, Natalie, okay, yes, you can voice your desire for people to kind of pull their weight a bit more. But also, are you are you sometimes fixating about this unnecessarily? Is there other times when you could just let this go and not try to be in control of all the things? Yeah. When something like that happens, just put on a song. Let it go. Let it go. <laughs> I'm one with it. <laughs> <laughs> but I do think, I think that these times, it's been interesting. Like we've been all home continuously, pretty or been pretty much together now for, I don't know, it's about 28 29 days or something like that. My husband was in Canada for work and li- like literally he came back and then his office closed. So that's like four weeks ago. So I think 29 days since he got back from Canada. So this is like day in, day out. We're pretty much together like all the time. Somehow we've all managed not to murder each other in the process. But I think it's about, I think we have to humanize ourselves and others because I think it is so easy to be like, oh, they don't do this and they don't do that. And, and, yeah. and listen, it's human to have those moments, but then we have to give ourselves and others grace. Right. Beautiful. And when we do that, I just think that, yes, we are still going to want the house to be tidied up. Yes, it would be great if they could clean up the crumbs after they slice the bread or whatever it is and just like put that away. But then you choose the grace for yourself and for them and you go, do you know what? This will get sorted one way or another. <laughs> We don't have to fall apart over this. That's beautiful. Natalie, I have two questions. One is, what are your three quick tips to living a stellar life? And second one, where can people find you? Three tips, boundaries, boundaries, boundaries. (laughs) (laughs) No, No, in all seriousness, one, boundaries. I feel like if everybody had a little bit more boundaries, we would live in an entirely different world. Like the world would be an entirely different place our relationships would be so different. And so if we all had a little bit more boundaries for ourselves, we have it also for our relationships. So I feel like boundaries is just knowing the difference between your feelings, thoughts, body, you know, stuff and somebody else's. And I think when you take responsibility for yourself, that's boundaries. And it's so loving and caring and trusting and respecting for you. Journal when you can. Don't make it into some editorial project, but honestly, have a go at journaling see how it could change your life. Even if you're only doing it like occasionally, I still think it can do wonders for you. And three, take time to breathe. Times like this, can you, you don't even realize how high you're breathing up in your chest mm-hmm. Yeah, <laughs> with the stress of everything. And I, I do think that there is a, a really great benefit. And I'm not even it, I mean, sure if you meditate and you want to do it that way, but honestly, sit in even for a minute And with your hand on your belly, just watching your your hand move up and down with your belly, doing a few deep breaths, just that helps you to kind of reground yourself as well. The more connected we are to ourselves, the better a life we live. Beautiful. And where can people find you? And 
maybe get your books or your courses or work with you? People can find me at baggagereclaim.com where you can find my blog and my podcast and links to my books and courses. And I have my course, Break the Cycle, which is now starting. And that's for basically helping people to work through the relationship blocks and baggage that stand in the way of them being who they really are or having the loving relationships they want. Perfect. Thank you so much, Natalie. This was really awesome. I appreciate you. Thank you, Orion. It was lovely. Thank you. And thank you, listeners. Remember to have more boundaries. Journal. Take the time to inhale and exhale and inhale and breathe and have a stellar life. This is Orion. Till next time. Thank you for joining me on my mission to light people up and change lives around the world. I hope today's conversation inspires you to step up, go after the life of your dreams, and be who you want to be. If you enjoyed this episode, make sure to go to StellarLifePodcast.com for show notes, transcripts, and other cool stuff. And please subscribe, review, and help spread the word by sharing us on Facebook and Twitter. Have a lovely day, and I'll catch you on the next episode.